So, Tim, I'll let you tell us the whole story. Turn it over to you. Thank you. All right, here we go. Good morning. Get this thing working. And I do need a podium because I'm going to have to look at my notes. I'm not, not a pro. Um, but at any rate, I just got introduced. Like I said, I've uh, been doing this right at 14 years now. We manage about 3,000 acres, roughly an hour south of Nashville in Murray and Hickman, Hickman counties in Tennessee. Um, and we've done cow-calf, stockers, custom grazing, used lambs, and lamb finishing. And that's sort of, the, sort of the short version. But at any rate, it's an honor to be included in this lineup of speakers today. I've heard all of you speak at some point over the years, and, and you don't know it, but each, each one of you that has meant a lot to my progress. So thanks and uh, honor to be included. I especially want to give thanks to uh, Greg Brand's not here, but Greg Halick. Both of them have been mentors and friends for a long time. So thank you, and, and don't blame them if I say something crazy. Um, of course, you don't do this without the support of family, um, and I want to and I want to uh, recognize our foreman, Alex Edmondson, here today, and it's a testament to his management that both of us were be able to leave the farm today, and we're you know we're, hopefully things are getting taken care of back at home. So, uh, so Chris tasked me with talking about my regenerative journey. And for me, it was a journey that I started as a naive idealist about 14 years ago. And after many winds and turns, we're still standing. There are many who started when I did it who are not. Um, so we're still here. I got a little bit more gray hair, but I've so far lived to tell the tale. And I'll get to the stuff that we all like to talk about, the animals, the grass, and the production. But there's plenty of speakers here today who are a lot smarter than that than me on those subjects. As I thought about what I might share with you today that might really help, I realized that the most important things thus far don't necessarily have to do with the grass. So I'm just going to tell you my story thus far and some of the hard lessons learned, and hopefully you can pick up something that will apply to you. One more general disclaimer. Nothing in this presentation is mine. I have a whole library of farm books, and I've probably been to a thousand conferences like this to get my education, so I'll try to give credit where I can. If nothing else, you'll know the books to read. Point number two is context. My path will not be your path. Just because something did or did not work for me at my place doesn't mean you can't make it work at yours. And I've tried a lot of things. Your path won't be the same, but it will have similar principles. And the last one is beware of the guru. And again, this is another context thing, but I think back to when I first started, I was invited to speak at the George Organics Conference. I don't know, in 2014 or something, and I cringe to think about what I told those people then. Uh, and I'll probably cringe 10 years from now thinking about what I'll tell you today, but just be aware of context is all I'm saying. So, all right. So, farming to save the world, that's our new mission statement. And I know it, it sounds a little ambitious, and this is the first time I've publicly unveiled that mission statement, so I thought it needed a little bit of explaining. Seems a little arrogant. Um, so these are the world's problems. It's the usual suspects. I guess most of them have been there since the beginning of the time. I didn't really want to get into this at a grazing conference. Um, and usually I'm too busy with trying to raise kids and keep the farm going to worry about it too much. But have you ever tried to solve all the world's problems? Maybe sitting by a campfire at night trying to get it figured out. People usually pick a certain lens to see things through. And my two lenses are Christianity and the soil. One thing to think about, and I think Ray's already basically done this talk, but all these things are connected, right? As a society, we may argue a lot about the science behind this stuff. But I, what I'm here to tell you is I, I don't need a PhD you know, to tell me that these things are real. I can see it right in front of my face. We live an hour south of Nashville, and just in my short life, I've watched some of the prettiest country on God's green earth continue to go under concrete and, and houses. Um, we get 56 inches of rain a year, and we're already having water wars in, in southern middle Tennessee over, you know, uh, pump and dryer river. So I don't need... It's right in front of our face, right? I think Tennessee is losing farmland at the third fastest rate in the country right now. 
If you don't believe me, though, I've also read a book called Dirt, The Erosion of Civilization. And in that book, I learned that basically we've been doing this since we settled Mesopotamia and, and all of the civilizations since, since then, their underlying success has been and, and fail, ultimate failure has been directly related to the way they treated their soil and their agricultural land. And if you don't believe that, you can always go back to the original story of Adam and Eve. Uh, you know, in a nutshell, it just seems that we can't help but crap in our own backyard. Um, and to me, it just means that, you know, we were meant to tend the garden, not to consume and, and extract. And that, to me, in a nutshell, is what regenerative agriculture means. Of course, Christ Jesus himself is the only way the world is really going to get saved. But in the meantime, a good farm is the antidote to all of this. There has never been a more important time or a more meaningful time in history to be a farmer. And all of us that get to do it should be grateful no matter what scale or what size you're at. Most people's daily lives only show them the broken concrete world that man has made. There are certain realities of life, how we get food, the ebb and flow of nature's balancing forces, real human relationship, and even life and death that our superficial urban lifestyle and industrial food systems hide. People today only notice nature in its extreme. When a natural disaster hits a city, a food disease infects a globally distributed food product, or when a loved one is gained or lost. More importantly, there are many lessons that you can learn about our creator living on a farm. Two, kids, two things that farm children know inherently growing up are that something has to give its life in order for you to have yours, and you have to give it yourself in order to receive. Imagine a world where people can't even see the stars, and you'll get exactly the culture we have in the U.S. today. So, farming's important. Well, another one of my main influences in the way I think is your own Wendell Berry, right? So how do we translate all this, stuff, this pie in the sky stuff down to a grass farm in Middle Tennessee? You do it with a vision statement. And I'll just read the first paragraph of ours, but Wendell's featured in it. To us, a well-run farm represents one of the highest of callings and is crucial work to building the world that we all want to live in. As Wendell Berry said, you cannot save the land apart from the people or the people apart from the land. A good farm provides tremendous value to society and the farm's owners, and this value is multifaceted. It includes physical, cultural, and spiritual benefits that are critical to the health of the land, the people, and the communities they make up. So our, and, and when you do your vision statement, it, ours goes on to describe what the farm will be like for the people, the relationships, the quality of life, future landscape, and how we will fulfill that mission of farming to save the world. And it evolves. We've chewed on it for 14 years, and we'll keep chewing on it, but it's basically been the same thing. I suspect that most of you in the regenerative movement are in it for one of these reasons or something similar. Whatever your reasons, if you're going to start your, your journey, you better know where you're going and why, and Simon Sinek is a good reference. Um, and with that, let's get started with the journey. So this is where I grew up. It's my parents' farm, and... and um, at the time, my great uncle was farming it. It comes from my dad's mother's family. We bought it in 1933. But that's basically on the left is what it looked like. And to me, that's just everything that's, you know, about it, poor about some agriculture, right? You've got erosion. You've got broken natural cycles everywhere. You've got sediment in the pond. You've got no wildlife. You've got nobody making money. And, you know, that's sort of how I grew up. I remember it was funny. I told my granddad, I hate, you know, I hate cows. <laughs> it's sort of ironic now. But I did grow up hunting and fishing all over Middle Tennessee, and I developed a real love for the land, and this was my summertime work, and, and, and like I said, I developed a real love for the land. So somewhere around eighth grade, my great uncle retired, and my mom and dad, who were not full-time farmers, my dad's a lawyer, my mom taught at local community college, started figuring out what they were going to do with this place. And they went to a Jim Garrish conference and learned about management intensive grazing. And they also learned you could put one sheep per cow, and away we go. So putting in all, and this is basically how the farm still looks today, but putting on all this infrastructure was my summertime work in high school and college. Um, I still didn't quite get it, but we, 
we noticed considerable improvement, and um, but still nobody thought there was any future in it. And I went off to the college and, and the Navy and didn't know, you know, had no plans of coming back to farm. Um, just a few comments. This is, you know, farm one of maybe eight or nine that I've been a part of, and it's better than nothing, but the flow is all messed up, and we've learned a lot about farm design since then. I'll just say that. Uh, but you can see the basic outline of the permanent fences and where we have water points. And its main issue is it was designed around a runway. But anyways. So I went off to the Navy. And you know, when you're out and gone for a long time, you get a good chance to think about the things that are really important. And I got to give credit to my dad. He sort of planted the seed. He sent me uh, two books while I was underway. Uh, how many, one of them was by Joel Salatin, and it was something about you can farm and this and that, and the other was holistic management. But I, I imagine there are a few others of you who are tricked into coming back because of Joel Salatin. Any, anybody want to admit to it? <laughs> but, and he's sort of a love him or hate him type character, and I, I still admire him, and I have to give him, you know, his book credit for I was like, well, you know, we can come home and try this, right? So I got to give Joel credit for getting me back to the farm. But I'll say it's Alan Savory and holistic management that, that have kept me on it. So, um, so I get back, so this is about 2010. I was still working full time for the Navy as a recruiter, and we had about 30 cows and 60 sheep. And thank goodness I didn't have a clue how hard it was going to be, or I maybe never would have started. So here we are, you know, doing the thing. All we got. Goats, chickens, cows uh, are all together, and it, you know, it's very cool. There's, there's the young couple, one baby on the ground. Uh, we built the first chicken processing facility. You can just imagine us standing at the farmer's market on Sundays, and we're, I mean, it's awesome. We're burning up our youthful energy, but having fun. Um, so... Sort of the first things that derailed me, ironically, I'll call it the first shiny object was more land. That picture on the left is the, my mother's family farm, which is about 45 minutes away. That's where she grew up, also a century farm. And uh, it was 500 acres, and I had the opportunity to take it over. And I'll just say in this case, it, was, it really wasn't more scale. Um, and I spent two years developing it, but really, in, at the end of the day, it was just a distraction. Um, we should have focused on growing the, the direct marketing business, um, and, and, and we don't farm anymore. I rent it out and manage it. Um, so the more land's not always better. And the other is somewhere along that line, we had, we'd gotten up to about 200 ewes, and we're like, oh, man, these sheep are easy. So I went and bought 200 more. We're going to do more of them, and uh, we got hoof rot. And then I lambed, and then we had about 900 sheep with hoof rot. And uh, I figured out that, you know, I thought before that, you know, we don't stink. Uh, I rotationally graze. We won't get worms. We won't get these things. And I, sure enough, I found out you can still get them. Um, this picture right here, though, one of my themes will be the people that you meet. Those guys are two big-time ranchers in California, and we've stayed close friends. But... I didn't know what to do, and they flew out from California and flipped sheep with me for three days in the rain, July in a 90-degree heat, and uh, so that's us. And, and by the way, we still didn't beat it. It, it, it was tough, but at any rate. Um, so that was sort of that era. One thing I should mention, and this will help all of your regenerative journeys, is that I married, I married very well. Uh, and for, you, you got to have the right partner to, to do this farming life. But in addition, mine happened to come with quite a bit more land. Um, so, so before I get into that, though, I'll just say that the uh, lessons I should have learned the first time. So at that time, when I moved home, I, I did a partnership with my parents for tax reasons. Bad idea. Caution when, when doing partnerships with family, and you better get in in writing if you do. Um, at that era, I was doing all these enterprises, and none of them well. And to start out learning production and learning marketing and learning distribution, it, most people burn out. 
so I, clearly some people make it, and I know some that have, but for me it was a lot. Um, the land expansion ended up being a distraction. Um, and the kind of sheep you have or the kind of animals you have matter. So when I was kind of wrapping up, trying to decide, well, we're going to keep doing direct marketing or not, I went to visit Seven Sons. I always go visit, find somebody who's doing it well and go visit. And they were the best I've seen. This was probably 2018 or somewhere in there. Um, and that sort of helped me make it. I saw what it took to be successful in that kind of business. And, um, and we had the opportunity now to take on more land, and so I made the decision to drop direct marketing. The other thing I learned on that trip was two enterprises max per, you know, for someone to manage, right? And so that, less, that lesson will come up again. Um, so my wife's family land became available, and it's about you know, roughly 2,000 acres in the western part of our county. Uh, and her brother is a lifelong friend of mine and still a good friend, and we decided that we were going to partner up and take over the world. Uh, and so we did and uh, set off to build the empire. We combined about, I had at that time about 100 some odd South Pole influenced cows, and we stuck them together with his grandfather's 200 ish monster Simmental cows, and uh, it was off to the races. The usual story, all the land was degraded, either in hay systems, con conventional cropping systems, or continuous grazing systems. And I think, you know, we had to undo six different leases. Um, there was minimal infrastructure. And so we started trying to get the basics in place on those farms. Um, I'll say we, we didn't have enough, clearly we didn't have enough cattle to start with. Uh, we started buying some here and there, and we also started doing custom grazing, and that, that would be that picture on the left would be like we started several hundred stalker cattle a year on the gain. Um, and it was okay. We were still burning youthful energy. That, that's, that was our main herd somewhere around that time. And then another major twist of life happened, one that I could not foresee, but my... Uh, my father's family, we still owned about 80 acres of a, a land-grant settlement also in the western part of Murray County on the Duck River, and it had been a dream for two generations to, to buy back that farm. And I'll, because I'm probably going to go long, I'll cut that story short, but long and short of it is, that happened. That, out of the blue, that happened, and I can only just say it was my dead ancestors pulling strings for me. So. We, Rachel and I left, we moved away from Glendale, uh, which was closer to her farm. That's my son, that's the family cemetery there on the place, so that's sort of the uh, Valhalla for the Kennedy crew. But um, at any rate, um, so after all that though, there's the two of us, we're running, it's just me and my brother-in-law, we're on seven different farms across three counties. And uh, doing a good job of running around, but not getting a lot of traction. Um, so we're spread thin once again. Uh, I'll say the land improvement had plateaued on all these places. You see an immediate improvement once you just stop the bad practices, but we weren't getting nearly the impact we needed to start turning on the biology at these places. Um, our ambitious growth, you know, we took on a bunch of over, we weren't, didn't have enough animal units to cover the overheads. Um, and I'll just say that the learning uh, curve on production agriculture is real. I mean, it, it, uh, we struggled with herd performance. We, you know, we got a calve in sync with nature, so we swift to May calving, which turns out in Tennessee in the summer, it's hard to breed a cow in August. Uh, we, you know, still learning that lesson. And then in our, you know, we realized, well, we need more cattle, so we just started buying cattle. Then we brought in disease, right? So we basically lost a year or two sort of cleaning that up and getting the cattle in sync. And that, I guess what I'm just saying is that there's a cost to sort of getting to adapted genetics. Um, and we still sort of had a split business. I was kind of keeping my far owned land in different books, and the partnership was doing different books. So... I guess making progress, but we weren't, we weren't getting anywhere, really. Still hopeful, but getting tired. And so this would have been about 2021. And so here we go. Now we're uh, the turnaround. I've got to give credit to Dave Pratt, another love him or hate him kind of guy. That's the title of his book. But I'll say 
I guess when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Um, we had been a part of a, we had organized our own peer group, and that was really was kind of what got me thinking as a board of guys who got together and we talked about our farms. And they really were the first impetus for kind of helping me get focused to where this business needed to thrive. And then with that being successful, I went to the ranching for private school and joined the e-executive link program, which we still do. I'll be speaking at it next week. But I, I do have to give that program credit. For me, it was a structure I needed to get this resource turned into a business. Um, so the first thing my board made me do, and, that, and you'll, you'll hear this there, is all problems are people problems. I think that's credited to Alan Crockett. Is they were like, man, why are you in this partnership? You know, like, it's not going good. And so we, you start down the dip, have the difficult conversation with family, which is sort of part of all family farms, I think. But my peer group made me do it, right? And I went home and did it, fully expecting that we would not be farming my wife's land anymore. So we've given up the direct marketing business. We've moved. We've done all these changes. And I was like, well, you know, whatever. We'll figure it out. Lo and behold, my brother-in-law is like, yeah, you're right. I'm not that into it. Why don't you just take it all over? So, so that's what happened. That we, you know, family still gets along, so there's a happy ending to that story. I learned my lesson. We get all of our leases in writing now, especially from family, and it's not because they're dishonest. It's because of short memories, right? Um, and the board helped me, you know, craft this vision. And we went through rebranding number three. So at this point, I've moved three times, and we've moved on to farm name number three. We've really discovered who we are now, and now that brings us up to current times. So here we go. Um, just check my time here. Oh, we good. I'm flying. I can go slower on these. So you talk about your resource, your land, your livestock, the people, and the finances. And I think holistic management has its own version of that. But our, our resources, we're in the historic, it's the Middle Tennessee Basin, which is very similar to your bluegrass region. It was a historic bluegrass. Uh, you know, used to have good soils, but they've, they've all been farmed for a long time. Um, like I said, roughly 55 inches. We get four full seasons, which y'all in Kentucky know, but my, my crowd next week won't. Um, we manage, that's sort of the breakdown on our acres. I forgot to put, uh, it's basically, I call it 2,200 acres of actual pasture. And along the lines of simplifying, by this time we drop from seven down to four, four main farms now. And that's sort of where we're at, two big ones and two satellite farms. Um, and we cut out the ones farther away. Um, and that's, you know, what NRCS says that we're supposed to be able to stock at in our area. Uh, uh, just a point of history, since I do have time. So the Duck River flows right through our farm. It's important because it is the most biologically diverse river in North America and the third most diverse in all of the world. Um, that particular shot, you see that first ripple. Uh, my, my fourth great-grandfather settled this place. My second great-grandfather built what's the dam and the grist mill. And the, so that ripple there is what's left of the dam. So the place has a lot of you know, historical significance to us. All right, so we're still talking about the land. This is a screenshot of Pasture Map, which is a tool we rely on heavily, and I'll tell you about it. And this one is just, um, that's just the Kettle Mills farm. So we've got Kettle Mills as one of our big farms, Canaan, which is aptly named my wife's family farm. It's the land of milk and honey, and then Glendale, where my parents live, and then another one called Hard Scrabble, which is a rough old hill farm. But you can see our permanent pastures. Um, the main ways we use pasture map is uh, it's really easy to see your rest periods. So that, that, I think that's this week even, and you can see the, the days there, the color coding of the places you just got off, and the numbers of the rest days. 
for us, as we've grown and had to manage multiple sites and multiple people, it's, it's really shown its value for employees and bringing onboarding new people. They know where they are on the farm. Um, and you can do the pasture bit subdivisions for them. Um, what else? So if you look up to the northwest corner, that is the, the last farm that I developed. And I'd like to think it's the best. But um, the things I would point out are I really thought about, and I got most of these ideas from the Wall Ranch, which farms in, on the Pacific Coast in Oregon, super sharp sheep people. But we, we wanted to design it for flow. So the paddocks flow together, and they all sort of flow back to the working pens, but also to make it easy to do subdivisions. Because we we're doing the daily moves, multiple days a move, and we want to make that easy with cattle and sheep. And we also spent a lot of time studying contour. But So most of those paddocks are long and narrow, but they're also on contour, fencing the sides of the hills with the tops of the hills. Um, the water points are, we generally will try to have a winter water point that services multiple fields, and then we'll have plug-ins so we can control manure distribute, you know, for portable water troughs all throughout that. And I think that's, um, oh, the other thing that we try to do that, I try to look at this like a yield monitor. So this pasture map will also keep track of how many animal days you've harvested off of each field. We're trying to get, but mainly it's a data entry error, but you, I'm trying to get to where we can directly show increased carrying capacity. You know, well, we did this practice on this field, and we got this many more animal days off of it than we did last year. Um, and we use that a lot, especially in the winter when we're um, managing our forage inventory and seeing if we can make it through the spring. You know, um, so there you go. That's what it looks like. There's a river snaking around. This happens to be. Uh, where the Duck River cuts out of the Middle Tennessee Basin, so the soils down there by the river are all basin soils, and then that hill farm I just talked about is all western highland rim, so steep up and down. And this is sort of what that, that hill farm, I'm, very, I'm quite pleased with this. Um, this field's that long one by the road. I, they're all where I can, and it's flat. They're 300 foot wide, which is two, two poly nets to subdivide. And uh, I guess if you do 150 feet, that's basically an acre. But you see the flow back to the working pens. That's real easy to slice off and get intense when you want to be intense. But it's also a big enough paddock that when you need to leave for a weekend, it's a three day cut, basically. Um, this other. Uh, the hill there would have had, there's a fence going down the valley, and then there's a fence at the rim. You see the line where the sheep stopped, and this is where it's really, um, so the sheep are bedding there, putting all their manure there, and we're actually getting manure distributed to the hillsides. If we didn't have that fence, they'd be crapping all on the top or the bottom. Um, so that's worked out pretty well. Uh, fence and water, that that's sort of our Cadillac. If we got the money, uh, that's the tires, we go with the 12 foot tires now for um, our fixed water points. Um, that's a Cadillac sheep fence if I'm getting equipped, that's what I do. And a word of caution, I've, I would not do that on my first farm. I've done enough of these, I know exactly where I want the fences, you know, but if you put that in the wrong place, you'll regret it for a long time. And then that, that next far one on the right is my cheap sheep fence. If it's on a rental place, it's, we throw up the timeless post and the high tensile electric, and away we go. Um, let's see. I do want to shout out to NRCS. Um, you know, for me, the cost share has been an enormous part of our journey, particularly the beginning farmer cost share. We would not have been able to build out 3,000 acres without it, you know, so that's been a, and using the thing, understanding the things that other programs that fit your context and don't, right, there's some things that'll be a distraction for you, but particularly fence and water worked very well for us. And then there's their expertise and support throughout the whole journey has been great, so. Um, this is a cool thing we do. Again, probably would not have done it without the cost share, but we've gotten some pretty, pretty amazing stands of natives. It's been a learning curve 
learning how to manage them, learning how to get the animal days out of them that we need. The one on the left is Big Blue and Indian. Those are, those are all stocker cattle. The, the one on the right is uh, Eastern Gamma, the Highlander variety. It actually comes from Kentucky. Um, and that's down the river bottom along the duck. Um, I think we got a really good, a lucky establishment year as far as rains, but all those fields have been cropped forever, so there really wasn't much competition when we, when we put the natives in and we got the right rain. And that's 20, uh, we planted them in 2017, and they basically still look the same. I mean, they're, they're, we've gotten to the point now where we are putting more pressure on them to try to get more diversity in those stands. But... Um, I think that's all I want to say about the natives. Well, I, I got another slide on them. Uh, this is sort of my fertility and land transformation slide. Uh, this is a rental farm that touches the kettle. When I, and in our country, y'all know this, but in five years, if you let a place go, that's what it looks like. And that's what it was when we took over. And really all we did was just run sheep in it, and then we would mow immediately behind. And after three years, that's supposed to be a video, but it's not going to work. But y'all can see it's almost straight Johnson grass. Um, so on that field, the low input, and that no chemi no fertilizer, no, no spraying whatsoever. Um, and on that field, it worked. We have had some places where I think it's not the weeds that bother me, but the fertility just some of the fields just still aren't coming back to live and just this isn't working. But in this case, it's worked beautifully. Um, and there's still a lot of weeds on that farm, but it's cheap food, you know. So, um, but that has generally been our philosophy on fertility. We have not applied fertility anywhere, and I'm not saying that's the right thing. That's one of the reasons I was excited about coming to this conference is there may be some places we need to. Do you manage the Johnson grass or? Ah, we, we, we love it. Um, we manage for it. So um, particularly at that time of year, I'll, I think that's my next slide. Um, um, so our general equipment philosophy, you, you will not see a bunch of shiny stuff at our place. That Ford I've been driving since I was in eighth grade. Our other two tractors are both older than me. Um, but I do try to have the stuff that we need. And I, I will say I've been cheap almost. The, I've kind of come off of that, right? I was holding back progress. I was being so cheap. So now we really try to focus on what the gear is we need, and we just buy it. We get it. If that's what we need, we get it. Another book I'll suggest is The Lean Farm. You see below, we try to keep our operational spaces like only the stuff you need for the day is there. It's handy. Of course, we don't always look neat and tidy, but that's what we strive for. Uh, the four-wheelers there, those are our horses. We try to design everything. that, the, For the most part, the farm can run off of an ATV. You're not starting a tractor every day. As we've gotten into feeding, which is a new thing, we have started to have to use tractors more. But for the most part, a shepherd gets a four-wheeler. You can see the ramps for crossing fences. And they're everything they need to do daily operations they do with the four-wheeler. Um, we have started to buy some newer stuff. We'll, we'll talk, remind me to talk about the feed bin, or I guess I'll talk about it now since i got time. Um, on the fertility deal, along with the bale grazing, we've done quite a bit of that. It just had not been able to get around all the farm. Um, one of the biggest things I learned from my early days with the chickens is just how powerful manure is. And, uh, and I forgot on that one, too, there was a good partnership that resulted from that first one. I was partners with a family in the chicken business, and we had a pretty good trade uh, taking wholesale birds to Nashville to restaurants. At any rate, when I left direct marketing, they kept doing chickens, and they're still doing chickens out at our farm at Glendale, and those are some nice fields. So I've learned the value of manure. Um, I'm not feeding chickens now, but we have started feeding lambs and learning how to effectively supplement, sort of come off the purest grass-fed stance and effectively supplement has been a big part of keeping animal performance up, um, whether we're talking cattle or sheep. Um, we feed lambs on pasture. 
And that, and I've started, I'm like, wow, dang, the field we fed the lambs in, that field's amazing. So we're sort of doing more of that. That's part of our uh, bringing fertility up. Wildlife, part of our vision is, is ever increasing abundance. And if it, wildlife is a huge part of our, what's important to us. We do the, we do the bird boxes, we, you know, we, we leave nesting cover. Um, we do the pollinator habitat. We, we got a partner with a, uh, not partner, but we let all the bee guys that want to be on the place do it, you know, all about increasing abundance. Um, we've got increasing coveys of wild quail at Canaan, which is no, no one else has at Canaan, so, I mean in Murray County, um, which is really cool. You know, that gets a lot of people excited. Okay. Adapted livestock, are they required? That's when I, I alluded to it earlier, but short answer for me is yes. Uh, um, you, once you start mimicking nature, you've got to have animals that can, that can do it um, with caveats. But for us, the sheep, we're, we're looking, we, of course, we have, there's our sheep. We have Katahdin-based hair sheep. Um, you know, no shearing, low labor. After my initial foray into the... Uh, hoof rot deal, I was like, I'm not going to be in the sheep business if I have to trim feet, so we just don't. Um, we'll treat, treat one if we have to, but it goes in the coal pile. Uh, I will say, we, by the time we got through the hoof rot adventure, we'd culled down to 90 ewes, so somewhere in 2015, we started building back, and basically, I bought in one whack of ewe lambs, but basically, we've been closed since then. Um, they got to raise twins on pasture with no assistance, and you know, we manage for, par we don't worm, do regular wormings on the ewes. We manage for parasite resistance, which is basically sheep that are adapted to our management system. Cattle were the same. I'll say we're, we're we, as of last week, we're out of the cattle business, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, we're not out permanently anyways. But we were in the same school of thought. We were going down the Johann Zeitzman, man cattle veld route. Um, really pushing fertility, really pushing the cattle uh, to have maximum utilization, um, and pushing stocking rate, basically, is, 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 is the deal. Um, but I'll say we, um, we have decided, as you'll see the last bullet point, though, is doing that with both cattle and sheep was complexity. So I finally learned my lesson one more time is, like, I still had too many enterprises. And what we've decided lately is that we need to learn how to make money with cattle that aren't special. We're going to have special sheep, um, but we sold all of our cows, and I think with the right supplement, we can get conventional cattle to do on our place is what I'm saying. So... Uh, so I guess that's the word of caution on adapted livestock. We spent a lot of years with no cash flow trying to get cycle through 600 cows. We got down to basically, oh, 150 that would do it, that would calve in May on a 45-day window and not lose body condition. We could have rebuilt from that, but it would have taken the rest of my life. So there you go. Uh, so, yeah, I've talked about our enterprises. That's... The, you know, bittersweet, that's the rest of our cows leaving last week. We have been in D3 for two years in a row. Um, so uh, that has had an impact, but you can sort of see what our you know, stocking rate was at when we started this year. And today we're we'll be putting rams on about 2,000 ewes this fall or just under, and we've still got 500 as finishing lambs, and, you know, I don't know what's next yet, so we'll talk about that. I did go to a KLR sell-by marketing school um, this, this summer, and it, this is my current thinking on stocking rate. It is one of the primary factors driving profitability, but I realize, especially if we're going to have these these the special genetics that I don't want to sell, which for me now is the sheep. I only want the, star, the farm stocked at 50 to 70 percent. We have to be able to be flexible. So uh, the, the year-round stocking of permanent animals will just be in that range, and then we're going to have to learn a flexible enterprise to, to seasonally stock with cattle or whatever, you know, to make it up, if that makes sense. Um, and two years of D3 drought will force you to learn that lesson. So... I knew it in my head before, and now I really know it. Um, 
And, uh, you know, it, for years it's been my, after my initial experiences trying to buy breeding stock, I got over my fear and we, we bought more sheep. I'm not mixing them with my old sheep. They're going to a separate farm. But we're, I, the lessons learned, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Even though the hoof rod initially about put me out of the sheep business, it's really what made me the sheep man. You know, I think I can handle it now. We've learned a lot. We have the skills to take on new animals. So uh, we'll see what happens. Um, so uh, this, I thought I'd just go through. Again, the, my videos are not going to work, but I'd sort of go through the grazing year, spring. We're having babies. Um, you know, just for example of what, we don't have these cows anymore, they're gone, but that red one right there was our best cow, like one of the never miss. So that's sort of what adapted looked like, ended up looking like for us. Our lambing is not actually that low labor. So to lamb, we, we lamb, pull probably lamb in a group of a thousand and we do the drift lambing. Um, but the main reason I justify it now is because we are trying to get the, we keep track of who twinned, we tag them, and then we know who raised twins. And so it's a lot of work, but we tag them all, and that's the best time to evaluate a ewe and my, you know, when you watch her lamb and see how she does. Um, but what we'll do is drift lamb, and we move them multiple times a day real tight, and you move the breads ahead, and each time you move, the ones that have lambed out are left behind, and you can kind of process them. And then you build these little groups of the ones that have lambed out. And uh, like I said, we probably won't do that as we continue to grow. It's just too much labor to do that across multiple farms. But as far as building that core of adapted genetics, that we'll probably keep doing that for that one. And you sort of get into growing season grazing. You can see we, so that's the sheep and the natives there. Uh, we can subdivide them with two poly wires. That's just, that's probably later in the summer on the cattle when we've gone more non-selective. But y'all can kind of see how, how it works. And then as you get farther into the summer, we start basically in July is stockpiling for winter. We start scrapping for animal days everywhere. And I, I guess the main thing is, I want, this is down there in the river bottom, and it's just tremendous biomass. But it's all things people hate, cockaburs and uh, uh, mare's tail and goldenrod and giant ragweed. But y'all can see how much, those, and this is dry use now. I wouldn't do this with anything else. But you can see how much the, the before and afters. And we got a bunch of animal days. And meanwhile, our fescue fields are stockpiling while we're down here cleaning up the end of summer. Same deal here, before and after. Uh, and then we, right around the same period, we'll wean the lambs. Um, like I said, we do feed on pasture. Um, and that is mainly a function of saving the grass for the ewes, but also lamb perform. They just do better until you can get them up to 60 pounds and get a little, they get a little bit more resistant. Um, I don't think we're going to keep running those advantage things, but that's what we have had. And then we get later in the fall, we'll start shipping out fats. We, we're GAP certified. We work with four, one of your hometown heroes, Four Hills Farm. Um, and we also supply the ethnic market. Um, so we're getting lambs ready, getting uh, developing ewe lambs for breeding. And I will say, you know, going forward, so those are our main markets, the ethnic market, um, your traditional, you know, fine lamb market, and then Next time y'all are looking for replacement ewe lambs or rams, you know, give us a call. We'll be having some. So, uh, and then the ewes at this point, they're going on fescue, and we're starting to flush them for breeding and Thanksgiving, basically. And we'll, again, as needed, like last year in the drought, we would supplement on pasture to add animal days. Have I used up my time now? Just about. All right, I'll get, let me wrap her up. We have learned how to use the natives in the winter with the right supplementation. Sheep will keep grazing too through the winter. Another good video. All kinds of crossings. Well, that video worked. Ah. Stuff happens. All right, the regenerative journey isn't all rainbows and butterflies. Some of them are your fault. Some of them are not. Um, but I will say production agriculture has its risks. Um, it's the people, 
at the end of the day, there's Alex, there's our shepherds. We do run H2A shepherds currently from South Africa, so we've got um, three full-time employees. And I will say this has been a game changer for me as far as now we're getting traction. All right, now we're really running a business. Now I have the bandwidth to do the planning we need to make things happen. But can anybody make a living doing this regenerative deal? And the short answer is yes. All right, I've paid for my education. Alan Savory said, or Alan Nation says it takes 10 years to be a doctor. He's got the 10,000 hour rule and we've paid our dues and that's right about the time we started, started doing good. So you got, I won't get into all this, but yes, both the land, the owning of the land business has been very profitable and the operation will be. And our vision is that, you know, we'll have a 10% after labor and rent is paid, we'll have a 10% return on our operational assets. And I think we'll get there in two years. Um, cash flow is another story. Uh, everybody's got their context, but I, I've, I have not had to get my groceries from the farm this whole time. We've been either working off the farm or whatever, and that has funded our growth. So this will probably be the first year that we actually get in and coming back. Additional enterprises, uh, we do a hunting lease on place, Airbnb, we've got a carbon deal. Um, where to next? Um, Fundamentally, I realize we're, we're a conservation organization. And so if you've ever read um, Let My People Go Surfing by Patagonia or uh, Doug Tompkins of North Face, like I don't know what we'll do next at May, but you can see the sub-brands of our larger. And then the good stuff, right? That's my children. We've missed, part of our vision is we've missed the boat if we don't achieve good country living, right? Like what's the point if we're not having fun? So. We try to keep doing that and having fun on the land. My three kids, my wife, Rachel. So there's the end. There's rainbows, you know, after all. It's, uh, it's something hard, but it's something worth doing by God. So tend the spot you got. Thank you. So we've got time for a couple of questions. The food's just a little bit late. Just have one more short thing before lunch. So, any questions for Sam? How is he marketing the staff? So, how is he marketing? Is the question. Yeah, <clears throat> lately we've just been selling, you know, commodity truck. We retain our own calves, wean in December, run them to the following August, and sell them as truckloads of, you know, seven weights. So, we did do some marketing to grass fed programs along the way, but this year it's just been commodity cattle. No, we, at that time, we were direct marketing all of it uh, and doing the farmer's market. And, and I think, you know, like I said, that other land was a distraction. I think if we had stayed focused on that business, you could make it fly. But our, our journey went differently. So, and we may, talking about the future, now that I've got a farm somewhat running, you know, we may circle back to meat sales or, you know, but you can't do it all at once. Repeat the question. Uh, she asked about the H2A program. Um, yeah, we started, I guess, three years ago. And, yeah, I mean, it, you, we wouldn't have food in this country without the H2A program. You get an agency um, to help you with it and come up with a job description and post it. And it's not, it's also kind of a hassle. We still interview, you know, um, but they come for a maximum of 10 months. And... It's been working for us so far. It's not ideal for me. I, I, one of my dreams is to create a pipeline to train up people, you know, local people, but it's getting the job done for now. So, so Sam, you've got to post it locally for the job Yeah. Uh, before you can hire H2A. Yeah. Correct. And that's why you get, a, you get somebody to help you with. They, they'll help you with all the postings and the government paperwork, and it would be hard to do by yourself, I think. So. Oh, we'll that later. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the ideas I want to, yes, but I don't. <laughs>
haven't had time to dig into it. So the question yeah. was about irrigation on those pastures. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, nope. Ha Want to look into it? Haven't done it yet. Another question. All, for, we're very fortunate, you know, land of milk and honey, being next to the Highland Rim, we got good wells on all these places. So all that is piped water off of wells. You missed the thing, Sam, again. 